Hello everybody and wa welcome back to our fourth installment of uh, brewery tours by the Beer Aficionados of the Greater Midwest in association with BeerPluma.com. Today we're here in Walker, Minnesota at Leech Lake Brewing Company where we're here to take you on a tour of one of Minnesota's northernmost brewers. Now these brews might be a little bit hard to find down in the cities but they are well worth the trip to find them. So uh, grab a brew, kick back and enjoy the tour with us. I'm here with Greg from Leech Lake Brewing Company, uh, and, and he's going to talk to us a little bit about his brewery and the brewery operations here. So, I guess the first question we'd like to know is, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the history of the brewery? Sure. We've been open since uh, September of 2010, at least the past one has been. Our first brew day was August of 2010, mm -hmm. and uh, we uh, got started here just kind of as a, almost a whim. Um, I was with IBM for 12 and a half years okay. and took a job in which I could work from home that enabled us to move up here to Walker, but we liked the vacation. And as uh, I was a little bit uh, tired and disappointed in my uh, my job as a technical sales specialist at IBM, I decided to kind of look around and see what kind of opportunities there were for us. You know, in terms of opening the business, I've been home brewing since 1992, so I had quite a bit of experience with that. Okay. And, uh, Friends and family they come up to vacation with us a lot, drinking a lot of my beer, and thought, uh, you know, they were, they were encouraging me to start a commercial brewery. So I uh, kind of looked at the map, and there wasn't anything in the area. And North Central Minnesota was pretty much wide open. So we thought, why not? We'll uh, try, to, try to launch a brewery. And Walker is just a great, uh, great location from a tourist destination perspective. And that, uh, you know, we love it here. Hopefully, you know, the beer, the beer will fit in. And, and, has so far. So, how, how has the community supported you uh, as you've uh, brought? So, you brought brewery in about uh, 2010. Right. How, how have they supported you throughout uh, your trials and tribulations as you, as you grew into a, a classic Minnesota staple? <laughs> well, thanks for saying so. Uh, <laughs> not, so not quite sure we're there yet, but uh, it's, there have been challenges, of course, as, as there are with any city. You yeah. know, you're, you're dealing with uh, a municipality that, uh, but, but they've been good in terms of working with, uh, with us. Uh, we had to go through a number of processes, of course, to uh, get our conditional use permit to operate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and then all the licenses that correspond with on and off sale. And the city's been uh, willing to work with us with, us with that. So uh, from that perspective, they've been really, really great. Uh, from a local perspective, we have uh, a large following. Uh, I mean, it's a small town, but many of those in this town uh, really enjoy our beer and follow us. Um, buy from us here at the top room with our growl sales, uh, but they also buy out of the local liquor stores, and we're constantly replenishing those, so it's been great. There are a lot of restaurants in the Walker area, and 90% of them carry our products, so uh, I, I can't ask for anything more, I don't think, from, uh, from the locals who are doing great for us. So. Now, a lot of our audience comes from the cities. Uh, do, you, do you have any uh, retail outlets in the, in, in the Twin Cities at this point? We do. We're uh, the best place to determine, discover where those are is on my Facebook page. On the, Facebook page? Yeah, our about section is where I keep that maintained. Okay. Um, you can link to that off of our website, uh, however you want to get there. But um, anytime we add a new, a new account to the cities, they're all liquor store accounts. Um, I, I definitely keep that up to date. So uh, I don't have any draft accounts down there yet, not so much because I uh, have it. Uh, you know, offered any or anything to that extent. It's just I can't make it down there quickly enough to return or to get tags there and, and bring up bring back the empties. It's just too much of a. Are you still stuff myself? Are you still soft distributing? We are. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I would imagine doing that as long as we possibly can. Yeah. However, there are a couple of really great distributors up here who are anxious about our business. And uh, if I could just get the volume, uh, you know, to. to uh, Kick out enough beer to make that justifiable, then we definitely jump into that. But right now, we're only brewing uh, about five, five and a half barrel batches, and it, there, there's just not enough beer to uh, justify that right now. So, okay, so uh, you mentioned we're actually in the full processing stage right now, primary fermentation, and we're going to sit down all over the floor. We just brewed our Lafayette Monster Scottish Ale on Wednesday, and so they're uh, actively bubbling the way here. Um, the way our system works, a little kludgy, but you know it, it, it's functional. Uh, I bought all this stuff, all the uh, polished stainless that you see, including the um, the brew house over here. I got all that used from Mexicali Brewing Company. 
rolled it in here. It was advertised as a three and a half barrel system. I thought they'd be brewing twice in the day and met out six barrels of beer. Where in fact I got this brought it into my garage. This building was being uh, upgraded, and thought, you know, there's no way that holds much more than what my water tank does at home. And uh, sure enough, it's the 58 gallon batches of what we're brewing of high gravity beer. So we have to brew three times in the day to net out five and a half barrels of beer. So I usually get here around five o'clock in the morning on a brew day. Um, my wife Gina and Grant uh, roll in here in the afternoon, give me a bit of a break, and I'll go home, work out, shower up, whatever, come back, and then I'm here until Grant and I will be here until 8.30, 9 o'clock at night. So they're long days, uh, we're talking 15 to 16 hours on average for a brew day, which consists of the three batches. So uh, anyway, we brew throughout the, up here, of course, we'll rack into these two uh, primary fermenters. These are actually serving tanks. Um, it's got nice little uh, features on them that work well for just a little, a little airlock. So uh, nothing too, nothing too uh, specialized here. It's just a homebrew airlock um, that we use on these. But rather than using these as as uh, serving tanks, we use them as secondary fermenters. So we'll rack the beer that's in here tomorrow, uh, combining them into one of these two open vessels over here. If we weren't brewing into these, say for example, my cylindrical conicals uh, were available, we'd just go three batches directly, one on top of the other, into those. And there, there it sits, of course, for a couple of weeks. So this is more of the home brew process where we're racking um, after a couple of days and then uh, going through secondary fermentation into here. Um, many of our beers are dry hops, so we'll dry hop and use vessels as well. Um, and then in terms of uh, kegging, out of this, we'll use this uh, Whirlpool vessel that's back here in the corner. Okay. And that I just simply use to com uh, combine some, uh, some dextrose so that we just prime it back up again because uh, all of our beer is naturally carbonated. So we go uh, dextrose into this, we pump the beer through it or into it to, to mix and then directly back out into kegs. And we're in our almost exclusively six barrel kegs, but we do have some half barrels as well generally used for cold storage before going into bottles, but we do have some big accounts that like the half barrel sizes instead of the six. So um, we'll sit in uh, kegs for about a week to condition over here. You're welcome to come on in and uh, have a look around. Uh, this is our keg washer sitting here. And then this is just kind of our conditioning area. And then our cooler's back in here when it's ready to go uh, out for, uh, for sale. A uh, little bottler back here that Grant's working on. Um, it's just two, a two-head two head machine. So we're all of the 22s at the moment. Uh, so we go two bottles in and uh, two bottles out. <laughs> and it just, it's a fairly productive little system. Um, we can get through a half barrel, a half barrel of beer within, I don't know, an hour or so. Um, now, in a walker, so it's kind of a big uh, seasonal town, as in like there's a real shift in population between summer and winter. How does that, how does that affect you and, and, and your business? Uh, retail is a huge component to our business, out of our town. Okay. Um, wholesale, you know, the margins are bad. Uh, I mean, out of kegs, it's not too, it's, it's decent out of keg sales, right? I mean, uh, our, our beer's not cheap, uh, quite frankly. And it goes, it, it's great selling tanks to the various bars and restaurants, but of course their business drops off this time of year as well, and we're almost exclusively in the Walker area in terms of our draft accounts. We go down to uh, uh, Bernard Baxter up and up to the Minji in terms of north south and over to Park Rapids, and uh, really nowhere further east of us than, than Walker at the moment from a draft account perspective. And bottle of sales. The, the, the margins are just so slim in bottles because the cost of goods is so high with respect to the packaging. The tap room is totally where the money is. If I can have this thing rocking, you know, six days a week, uh, all day long, all, all year long, we probably wouldn't distribute even very much beer because uh, this would sustain us. So, given the seasonality, this totally drops off in wintertime, at least for these early. Fall of the, the fall months, uh, October, November is really quite quiet, and then April, March, excuse me, March, April, um, yeah. is quiet again because the ice oh, is coming okay. out of the lake, and, it's, and then it picks back up in, in May, of course. But um, 
anyway, it's, it's difficult because we have to rely so much on the wholesale side of the business in, in this part of the year. So, sure, kind of the year yeah. so. And, and how, how is the, has the local populace jumped on board uh, with Leech Lake Brewing yet? I mean, are you finding that uh, the people are asking for it at the local establishments? Yeah, yeah, without a doubt. Uh, we've got a couple of accounts here locally that sell a lot of our beer. And I mean, they, I think they actively push it, if you will, or promote it, I should say, is maybe the better word. Um, some of the others just have not tapped and don't necessarily promote it as much. And this, it, it still sells, but a couple of these accounts that we have just rock through it. So it's, it's great, regardless of the, of the time of year, it seems. So, um, Bridget's Cross, for one example, up in, up in Bemidji, they have two lines. Got this uh, cheesy little homebrew kit with uh, some, I don't even know what it was supposed to be. I don't remember the style here. Um, didn't really matter. I just, we brewed it up, and it was uh, very simple. It was just simply a, a very straightforward uh, extract kit, and brewed it. Turned out great, and thought, you know, that's kind of cool. And uh, you know, it was cheap. We produced a pretty good beer, and I did a little more, a little bit more research. Found that the equipment that we bought within that kit was pretty cheesy. Could have gotten a lot better equipment for less money, and so I went out and I started to amp it up my uh, That's the right stuff. stuff. Yeah, but we continued to brew um, extract kits, or not so much kits, uh, more like clones, um, for the next year or so, and then I, or the next, probably wasn't even that long, but anyway, started getting into mini mashing shortly thereafter, and. Uh, then started developing my own recipes, accumulated all the homebrew, or excuse me, all, all the all grain equipment, and uh, jumped into all grain within two years of my first batch of beer. And I would recommend to anybody who wants to get into brewing and has done, you know, at least made a batch that they think is good and they're proud of and they enjoy to jump straight into all grain. So there's just no other, no other way around it. Uh, it's just definitely the best. Uh, most fulfilling way to brew beer and you can develop your own recipes, do whatever you want to with that. I mean, it's just better than extract and all the other stuff. So, so then, at what point was it? I need to start a brewery. Where, when did that first pop in your head? Uh, down in the Rochester area, where we last lived while I was at IBM, um, I had another buddy down there who was a home brewer. He and I actually. Uh, we knew that one of the uh, original founders of the Vangible Brewing Company does. Okay. He was also an IBM, uh, one of the six guys in kind of that company. And we sat down and talked to him about his experience one day over coffee. And he was just so excited about it. And he was, you know, you could tell uh, just the passion uh, that he had for it and how he was lamenting the fact that they ended up selling it and all the, the way that their group broke apart. But um, we were under the impression that Vangible Brewing Company was the pump, no longer operational. So we went and met with Todd Fighton, the owner now and the owner then of the Central Brewing Company to find out, you know, if there was any possibility of our, our buying it. He was in the process of kind of ramping back up. So that was a good 10 years ago, um, at least at this point, that we had given that some thought. So it wasn't really an unusual thought by the time we moved up here, up here and kind of got into this. Um, it had been on our minds. We'd always been looking for an opportunity to start a business. With a little bit of encouragement from friends and family, as I said before, it, uh, it just kind of clicked. You know, put together the business plan up here and got one of the local bankers to, to get excited about it and jump on. And, um, so it just it just works. You know, it just works. Yeah. So <laughs> it's like you have a great operation. So that's fine. Um, Anyway, these are the seven staples that we keep on tap year round. And then the one not pictured here is our stout because we don't produce labels for our beers that are seasonal. So I'll start you out with this red. It's the mildest, least bitter of the bunch. Okay. That's Loom's Eye Red. Okay, so this is your Loom's Eye Red, and this is a, I'm sorry, what style is this one again? It's not our style. style red, yep. So you should find it's uh, creamy, um, 
rather uh, malty and very, very little bitterness. Yep, definitely. I mean, I'm getting all that in the flavor profile. And I hate to see you, you know, drinking just two of the other so I'm going to have to try it. <laughs> well, cheers, cheers. cheers. Thanks for hosting us. Oh, my yes, I do. Pretty good. So, yourself the pretzels if you like. So, how did you how did you come up with this one? Why? I, uh, what, first off, which one of these was your, was your first beer that you had? Blackfish Monster Scottish Ale was your first. Okay. And that's um, you know, I mean, we're a Leaf's Lake Brewing Company. It's a Scottish Ale. Blackfish Monster just kind of immediately popped into my head. So, uh, that was the that was our inaugural beer. It's our flagship. Uh, brewed this one on August thirteenth, twenty ten. Took me 40 hours to brew that batch, or those three batches. Uh, it was a brutal day, brutal two days. Uh, pretty much on my feet the entire time. We had kids sleeping here in the tap room <laughs> on the floor. My wife was kind of crashed on the floor of the brewery every now and then when she could. And I was running the entire time trying to figure out why the steam generator was uh, tripping and you know, the, we were having low water indicators and all sorts of other issues. So. Now, I, I know when I got your, your first email, uh, you were talking to me about how this is a joint operation between you and your wife. That's, that's not something I hear a whole lot about from some of the breweries I've been through. Um, so how is that working as a married couple? I mean, it's good. It's, it's stressful. I mean, we're together a lot as a result. And it, uh, you know, it's, it's all right. Uh, I mean, she primarily does, well helps me out with a lot of the cleaning. Okay. Um, as I, I come in here early, as I said, I get started cleaning up the clean the brew house, and then uh, roll into whatever primary we're going to use, uh, getting that cleaned up, and then she'll roll in here after she takes care of the kids in the morning, and kind of take over the cleaning process while I continue to brew the first batch and get into the second. And then from at that point, she kind of manages the tap room and that kind of thing. This is really her deal. So, yeah. So I'm going to go the Scottish. So why why is Scottish Ale? I just always enjoy the. Uh, I'm from Colorado originally. Okay. Odell's has always been a favorite of mine, and I drank a lot of their ninety shilling. The ninety shilling day. Yeah. So I just uh, because of that beer, I started brewing Scottish ales at home. Um, never did I try to mimic theirs or imitate it. Just brewed, made my own recipes and brewed them myself, but. Um, just always been one I've enjoyed. So. Yeah. I call me amateur. I got my nose on. It's nice and sweet, very smooth. Yeah, very also butley hopped, of course. Mm -hmm. It's uh, traditional. All these beers, I've tried to keep true to tra tradition in terms of uh, frame bill, etc. but and, then, and one thing that I don't know, some people look down upon, I think, in my brewery, um, but I like because it's a really traditional hop. I use Fuggle hops exclusively in all okay. these beers, uh, but you know, I get some some uh, I don't know negative feedback, I guess, from that sometimes. When people are like, "Oh, come on, it's all it's all Fuggle. Where's the creativity and difference in, in that?" But they all taste different. They're all unique, um, despite that. And Fuggle is just a great uh, traditional British hop, and it's, uh, it, it imparts the flavor that I want in these. It, even in our IPA, it's bitter, 93 IBUs, but at the same time, it's got a good malt backbone to it. The Fuggle isn't overwhelming. I'm not into in your face slamming you with anything, be it maltiness or bitterness or sourness or whatever. I'm looking for whatever the, the goal is, I like balance, and I think that. Uh, that pop really enables balance in the beer, so that's that's my thing. Everybody's got to have a thing. Yep. Crowd favorite. When, when you go, I mean, are, now are you at a point now in your relationship with your beers that uh, you have to have your own beers, or, or do you like to go out and try different things to see what else is out there? And, uh, given the opportunity, I like to try other beers, but. Um, my beer is about the only beer I can afford these days, so <laughs> this is where I'm at. Uh, and our beer, 
I mean, I, I do get burned out on making the same stuff all over, or over and over again, but this stuff blends incredibly well one with the next. I mean, in the morning or whatever, early afternoon, I'll come in and just rub my, my glass through every one of these things just to clear the lines, you know, and get ready to serve. And uh, all eight of them combined are wonderful together. But, uh, so we have lots of different combos that we put together, like uh, we call a South African, our 47 degrees north and um, driven snow mix. And uh, killer, killer combo. So lots of great combinations. So I do a lot of mixing and matching just to kind of not get burned out on the same stuff all the time. Do you find that one of your beers is more popular than the other? You know, they all sell with a percentage or two of each other um, in the wholesale and the retail market out um, on the liquor stores. And in here, uh, you know, really it's, it follows the same pattern. Uh, three sheets is probably our most popular, but it's the most expensive, so we sell less of it. I brew less of it because it's such a huge grain bill. I can only brew three and a half barrel batches um, uh, of this in a day. Um, so it all works out, but from a revenue perspective, we're making as much money on three sheets as we are any of these others. Um, but it's 10 and a half percent alcohol, so you know, don't drink a whole lot. That's hence the name three sheets. Right, right. So. What would be your favorite? Um, you know, you're asking me to define my favorite. You're asking me to like picking your favorite. <laughs> I know. Out, out of all of them, what, which one would you rather drink, though? Uh, I, I gravitate a lot to Driven Snow or Porter. Um, and again, I'll, I'll drink a lot of this in 50 50 combo, the mm -hmm. Porter and IPA. Right. Um, the, the Porter is it, it's just a nice, mellow, smooth Porter, and then you throw some bitterness in there with it, and it's, it's pretty killer. Well, here we have the, the, the Blindside Pale Ale, so why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about that one? Uh, Blindside is, again, a traditional English pale that um, is, again, I'm not sure if I said this, I shouldn't say again. I'm, Hopefully, hopefully you guys can do a good job of <laughs> this stuff out. Oh, yeah, <laughs> no problem. Editing's easy. Uh, good. Um, our, our blindside pale ale, along with all of these, are, again, traditional in the sense that I'm using traditional ingredients. Uh, everything but the two row is coming from Great Britain, um, uh, UK. Um, but, the, but they're all amped up in alcohol a bit. You know, I mean, that's the only difference. This would probably be around 4% alcohol if you're in England drinking a pale ale, but this is six and a half percent. So you're gonna find it to be, I hope, uh, you'll find it to be real malty, but mm -hmm. then uh, have a nice bitter finish to it, uh, but not overwhelmingly bitter. It's just uh, just a mellow, just, you know, not really bitter beer. It's kind of funny, this is this is actually our, our fourth, uh, you're our fourth brewery on our, on our on our series of uh, brewery tours here, yeah. and you're the fourth brewer of the four breweries I've been to that's like, when we brew a pale ale, we don't over hop it. We like it mellow. <laughs> and, and I kind of like that because I think too much that the industry has gone towards uh, hoppy notes. You know, it's, we've got to over hop our beer. We've got to have the most bitter beer on the planet nowadays. And I guess it's gotten way too out of hand now. And now I go, I remember the, the second brew fest I ever been to, every brewer had an Indian pale ale. And I think I got fed up with it. I was like, I'm not drinking a single one of these. I, I came here to drink something different. I'm totally with you. And you're gonna, I'm looking forward to your impression of the uh, IPA here um, because it's not the traditional IPAs. Well, the American style IPAs. You're making it the, the old British way, the way it's supposed to be. At least that's my intent, yes. So, <laughs> okay, so this is our ESC. Yeah. Again, none of these are filtered. This one's particularly cloudy, this batch. Just happens stuff here. happens. No, I, I have to tell you, I'm a big connoisseur of uh, English English specials. So oh, good. Um, next to four, next to Pilsner's, this is my one of my favorite lines of beer. So definitely looking forward to your impression. Then um, this is brewed with brown sugar, so it's uh, it's seven and a half percent alcohol. So it's a big beer. Um, you, you should find it very malty to start with and finish bitter. So, but it's well, certainly one of my favorites. Like the bunch here a little bit. But it's definitely a much more alcoholic ESD than. I'm definitely feeling it, but uh, like I guess the only Minnesota comparison I have is uh, Sheep's Head by, uh, by Brow Brothers. Hmm. Oh, there we go. There we go. 
very well done. Right. Oh, thank you. Extremely well done. It's, it's got, it kicks in with that sweet and then kind of just floats back into that bitterness in just a tinge. Yeah. Not not overhanded. 60 IBU, so it's and, a lot. And for 7%, I have to say I'm not tasting the alcohol, which is another good sign. Good. So, great job. Thank you very much. It's a very smooth beer. Mm -hmm. Smooth is almost always the word we hear out of every one of our guests that come through here. If they're going to co comment in any way, it's almost always smooth. It is very smooth. Thank you. I enjoy it. That's a... That's a tough, uh, it's an expensive beer to brew, that one, to say the least. The grain bill's huge, plus all the um, brown sugar that we dump into it and everything, so it's... Do you use a particular brand of brown sugar, or just whatever you can direct your hands uh, on? What is it, CNG, is that right? Um, CNH? CNH, thank CNH. you. CNH, yeah. It's my favorite porter and perhaps my favorite beer on the planet. So, if I do say so myself. I find porters to be a nice, versatile palate. I mean, there's nothing you can't pair a porter with. I've seen porters paired with peppers, I've seen them paired with vanilla and chocolate, I have yeah. seen them pour everything. You, I mean, if you can make a tomato beer, I have no doubt it would be a porter. <laughs> well, and people claim that this isn't an appropriate summer beer, but I can drink this on a 100 degree day out in the boat, you know, all day long, it doesn't bother me, so I love it. Nice coffee taste to it. Yep. Very smooth. What uh, uh, EBB are we looking at about for this one? Six and a half. Six and a half? Well, you, you brew some strong ones. Looking for those cold Six winters up here. <laughs> right. <laughs> Six is the least uh, of our alcohol content, so. Okay, so which ones are, which ones are the sixes? Uh, the red and the Scottish. And then we go to six and a half for the pale, seven and a half for the ESB, six and a half for the quarter, seven for the IPA, and ten and a half for the Imperial. And the uh, stout is actually supposed to be 8%. That's what we hit for uh, potential. And for some reason, for the first time in 20 years of brewing, this yeast stalled out at 6. So I pulled it and because uh, it was great. It, and we don't need to go to 8. You know, it's not that big a deal. I didn't repitch any yeast or anything like that or add anything, I should say. And just yanked it at 6, and it's spot on. So And, and, I, and you've controlled the alcohol flavor or the, the alcohol... I guess it's not a flavor, but it's a, the alcohol the hot taste. Yeah, uh, you've really controlled that in all of your beers. I mean, it's like I, if you if I were drinking this one on my own, I mean, I would guess around five. So yeah. to hear that it's a six percent, I mean, that's you got to kind of be careful. Yes, <laughs> they'll sneak up on you. You're, you're pushing <laughs> up the limits on session beers here, for sure. <laughs> I don't do sessions. It doesn't it doesn't make sense to me. Just range. <laughs> now, um, for your. Uh, Kind of off topic here, but uh, for your distribution, do you you just do the bombers, the 22 ounces? Yes, except for the three sheets, it's also in a 750, and it's corked and wired like this. And we can sell these out of here in the 750 format, and also wholesale. But we are here's another uh, absolutely okay. So here we go. So this is the so this is the IPA uh, again. You should find it to be. Better because it's you know intentionally better. That's what an IPA should be exactly. But at the same time, you should not be like, oh, give me a glass of water to drink with this beer. It should be refreshing. You should still be getting some sweetness out of the, out of the backbone. And uh, I mean, I get a lot of malt out of it still. Congratulations, you have brewed the best IPA I've ever drank. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Let me pour a little bit, and I'll say cheers for that. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> thank you. Uh, guys, uh, if there's if there's a uh, one IPA you want to drink, the uh, Leech Lake Brewing has it. It's there, 47 degrees north, and uh, I mean this this is done in the traditional uh, British style. It's smooth. It has a nice sweetness to it, and it's not going to be overpowering and over hot. So uh, if you want to know what an IPA should taste like, this is it. <laughs> Thank you. Very very generous. But. I'm looking it, forward to your uh, sampling this one. But. It's it's bitter, but as soon as it's you're done, drinkable. as soon as you're done drinking it, it's gone. Like it doesn't like some of those beers. It doesn't linger. Yeah, it lingers for a long time, and you're like, I needed something to drink after, or eat afterwards, and yeah, yeah, I don't like to have to drink water with my beer. Yeah, <laughs> this one's better actually. Yours is a little bit murky for some reason. That was a lot clearer. Oh yeah. If you want, I don't know if you want that. Oh yeah. <laughs> there you go. 
Um, I mean, the flavor will all be there. Yours just looks a little bit hazier. Uh, but what was I saying? I'm sorry. Oh, I want to rebrand this. It's an Imperial IPA right now. I get not a lot of flack for it, but people say that's not an IPA or not an Imperial IPA. Again, it's British. It's, it's brewed with to a British style in terms of grain bill, etc. It's a completely different grain bill from my IPA. It's not just an amped up. Is <laughs> that a good reaction or not? It's got a kick to it. It's like a kick like a mule. I like it. I do like it. Yeah. Ten and a half. That will sneak up on you for sure. Well, that, no, that one doesn't sneak up on you. That one gets <laughs> 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 I just hit you. But it's drinking one of those 750s by yourself. Kind of make you wish you hadn't by the next morning. But, uh, <laughs> at least after my experience. Um, a little bit of water the night before, maybe an Advil, you'll be all right. But, um, anyway, I'm thinking about rebranding it as an Imperial Caramel IPA because the caramel bill and the, car the caramel grain bill in this is so high. It's like, what's the percentage of uh, caramel malt? It's 18 pounds in a, uh, in a 40 gallon batch of caramel grain, huge percentage. Anyway, so you get a lot of caramel out of this. I, I consider it to be a, if somebody asks me what it tastes like, I say it's a caramel apple brandy. That's what I get out of it. And a lot of people are like, that's not an IPA, you know, it, but it is. Um, it's 100 IBUs, um, kind of coincide with the 10.5 ABV, but it's not an American Imperial IPA. I, just out of curiosity, I don't want to tell you how to run your business or anything, but uh, have you ever thought about putting British style Indian Pale Ale or British I, style? I need to do that, or at least English, English style, yeah. I need to do that, and I should have done that. You're exactly right, and it should have been on these in the first place. I was trying to, not so much trying to, but on my labels, uh, I've got little marketing descriptions here, right? And, uh, in some cases, the, the uh, CTD required me to do things I didn't want to do um, that became redundant. And another case, I was just trying to limit the, the verbiage on it to some extent. And uh, I just didn't go there, but now I'm wishing I had uh, indicated their English style. I should have. And I think once it comes down to, uh, once it comes down to uh, reformatting these for, Aluminum bottles, I'll make those changes. So, yeah, it uh, definitely would be a good idea. I like that. There's not enough British style beers in Minnesota yet. Oh, no. So you definitely got the corner market on that. So, I mean, it's. I taste the tradition. I mean, I really can taste. I mean, these really do taste like beers. More like a beer that I would expect from Europe than I would from the US. Cool. Which is definitely a good thing. I mean, I definitely so. a good thing. Thank you. Definitely appreciate that. And that stout that you're going to try next, that was brutal. It took me 29 hours to brew that one because 25% uh, of that grain bill is is uh, this dark stuff. And, I mean, a handful of different uh, black, black grains, you know. Um, and that kind of gets pulverized in the middle. You know, the two row mill's nice and you know, nice and clean, and uh, it's pretty easily controlled to get the husks to break apart, but this stuff just, just turns into not so much flour, pretty close, and so that caused my sparge to really hang up, um, and doing it three times uh, in a brew day, we're, talk, we're talking four hour sparges, for, mm -hmm. while for, to get 88 gallons through four, I mean it took four hours to get 88 gallons to flow through, and that was painful, so. 29 hours later, I was rolling out of here, and uh, during the night, I was just trying to stay awake, and or actually, I wanted to sleep a little bit while I was sparking, but uh, my steam generator kept kicking on and waking me up. But <laughs> so when you're when you're experimenting with new beers, um, do you just do a homebrew batch, or, or or do you do how how do you how do you when you brewed your stout, how did you come up with your stout recipe? I just trust my instincts after 20 years. Okay. I just throw the recipe together and I, I use a ProMash software. Okay. And I use that for 15 years probably, if not longer, to develop recipes. And I, I trust it, I trust, you know, my gut. And I just brew and it seems to work out every time. So, 
So now this is your 150 degree... 150 feet. 150 feet deep stout. And that is definitely a stout. I mean, you're not... I'm not getting any light to that whatsoever. <laughs> so, I mean, that is really dark. <laughs> That's a nice smokiness to that. Yeah. Is that what I should be picking up on, or? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, it's got a combination of pretty much every dark grain you can throw into a beer. Okay. And, uh, so yeah, you should be getting some caramel, or excuse me, well, yeah, a little bit of caramel. It's got uh, extra dark uh, crystal in it. Mm -hmm. um, it's got uh, black patents. It's got uh, roasted barley. It's got chocolate. Um, so, you know, uh, all the dark stuff is, is in there, and you should be pulling a little bit of all of that out, so. Okay. Definitely give Guinness room for its money. <laughs> well, thanks. It's, oh, and also, the impetus behind this beer, really, I should tell you this, was, uh, you know, this kind of, I'm not, I'm not a bad guy. I'm not into doing what everybody else is doing at all, and black IPAs, Kind of became bad there, and I get a little bit annoyed and perturbed by that. And so instead, I decided to brew a, a big stout for the winter instead of a black IPA. And, and not that I needed to brew a black IPA per se, but I wanted to brew something winterish. Went with this, and so this is uh, really a foreign extra stout, um, 73 IBUs. So I really beefed up the, the bitterness in this beer. Um, just as a means by which to kind of make it IPA-ish, right? And uh, but not going the black IPA route. Instead, I, I prefer a stout over over black IPA. So that was the reason behind this beer. Good choice. Thank you. It's really good. That is really good. Thanks. That's given uh, the other one the run for the money for which the best one? one. Was it? Uh, oh, uh, Minobi. Yeah. yeah. Well, Minobi, yeah. Tell you what, I'll, I'll pour you a 50 50 stout in Minobi. That's, I call it, a, we call it drink and go deep. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, because Minobi means drink and be merry in Ojibwe. So, um, there's the drink and go deep component. All right. Yeah. <laughs> it's great because you get the bitterness out of that beer and then the real sweetness out of that ESB. That's it's, good. It's a good combo. So you want to try the? I, I'm going to try that one, and I'm going to I'm going to have to call that one a day. So, all right, I'm starting.